So welcome everyone to this afternoon dreary outside day. Um, my name is James Green. I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative and I'm a professor of uh, Latin American history and Portuguese and Brazilian studies at Brown University. And this event is part of our year's theme in the Brazil Initiative of looking Brazil in a global perspective, Brazil in the world, the way Brazil is interacting with other parts of the world. Um, China, India, and the Middle East have been three areas we've been looking at, and also the African diaspora uh, in, in Brazil. Um, so this is a new uh, way in which people looking at Brazil are thinking about the country, and we're kind of excited to organize lectures that get us to think beyond the borders of that continent country uh, to other parts of the world. So Rahul um, Siohi, is an assistant professor at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences uh, in India. And I learned now about this, and this shows my unapologetic <coughs> stupidity and lack of knowledge about India, and I apologize, but no, unapologetic, so I don't apologize. I should apologize. Um, that the, the Tata Institute is a foundation established in the 50s by um, some wealthy uh, entrepreneurs who started in the steel industry and wanted to link to the, the Congress party that led the independence movement and wanted to invest in developing social sciences and e economics in India as part of the process of, of the country developing. And it's a very prestigious place to be working. Uh, and he uh, was here in Providence last year at Providence College, but he received his PhD at the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign working with one of the most important economists of Brazil in the United States, Werner Baer. Um, and he has a wide range of interests, um, but over the last few years, he's become particularly interested in the economies of Brazil and India. In fact, before uh, this lecture, we were talking about an article he wrote, a comparative study of the railroad system in Brazil and the railroad system in India, um, their similarities and their differences, and um, very smart, layered understanding of at least the Brazil side for me, and I'm sure that your India side was very layered and smart as well, but allowed us to really think together about um, how the railroads developed and why they developed in Brazil. So the title of his talk today is Alternative Paths to Economic Development, a Comparative Analysis of Brazil and India and the Era of Neoliberalism, and I want to welcome you to Brown University. Uh, well, uh, I think I'll begin by thanking uh, the organizers of this event. Uh, this is obviously a great opportunity for me to come and uh, <clears throat> uh, interact with the faculty and students here. So as uh, Professor Green just mentioned, over the last few years, I've become really, really interested in the economies of Brazil and India. Um, and so today, what I thought I'd do is maybe talk a little about a paper that I've been working on which compares these two economies over, the, perf the performance of these two economies over the last two or decades. Now, let me begin by saying that comparing a comparative analysis of these two economies has been such an interesting project, a real, real worthwhile thing to do. Um, for one, um, both these economies, at least the last, barring the last one or two years, uh, there's been a long spell of high growth rates, macroeconomic stability. Uh, both countries have become uh, exporters of sophisticated goods. They attract foreign investment from all over the world. And so the sheer economic weight of these countries is enough for us to just stop and have a look at what's happening here. So Jim O'Neill, who was the chief economist at Goldman Sachs in 2001, coined the term brick economies to highlight the role of four emerging, very important uh, economies in the world, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Now, of course, the Chinese economic performance has sort of overshadowed all the others, but Brazil and India are a very, very important part of this alliance. Um, now, there is, at least from what I can see, another reason for us uh, to actually do a comparative study like this. Um, a comparative analysis of these two countries sort of forces you to uh, forces you to realize that neoliberalism is not a complete project. Uh, there's no universal blueprint of how neoliberalism is adopted. Um, different neoliberal economies have adopted varying uh, varied approaches to economic development. They have liberalized to very different extents. Uh, 
therefore in a very strange way even though we live in a globalized world uh institutional historical political peculiarities of these regions still matter right and a comparative analysis sort of forces you to recognize all this um so this from this sort of a comparative uh, perspective this comparative framework that i seek to sort of understand what's been happening in these two economies the nature of neoliberalism what policies have been adopted um i'll also spend a lot of time looking at the economic and social impact of uh, neoliberal policies in these two countries um now before i sort of move on before i get to the meat of uh, the argument i just want to make a very brief theoretical digression i'm not going to bore you with a long literature review but because i'm uh, interested in trying to understand the social and economic impact of neoliberalism i just want to very briefly talk about the large economic uh, literature and uh, development economics that exists out there that sort of talks about the relationship between growth inequality and uh, uh, human development now one really interesting thing that has come out from all these debates within economics is that from the perspective of human development rather than growth what matters more is the process through which that growth has uh, been attained so you could potentially think of a situation where growth uh, that a country produces uh, uh, sorry where growth is a product of investments in human capital where growth is a product of expanding uh, human capabilities in such a situation it's possible to generate a virtuous cycle of development where both growth and human development sort of reinforce each other on the other hand you could also think of a situation where growth is inherently uh, predatory where growth is contingent on creating inequalities in this case growth however high is not going to trickle down to the poorest right and so there's this very interesting literature in economics that is now talking about not simply growth not simply trickle down of growth but the very process through which that growth has been attained and so i'm just i mean there's a lot of literature a lot of empirical work that has been done on this issue and i um, it's been done both in economics and political science and so on and so forth but i derive heavily on a paper by lavo and stockhammer and also on the works of atul kohli who's written extensively on india and uh, essentially what i'm going to do from now on is talk about two very different patterns of growth on the one hand you have a pro labor pattern of growth a uh, pro labor regime if you like to call it which is an economic regime where growth itself is contingent on increases in the wage shares in the uh, national income growth is contingent on investments in human capacity in investments in education in health and so on um a pro business path of economic development refers to an economic regime uh, where growth is contingent not on increases in wage share but is contingent on increase on uh, increasing the uh, share of profits in total income um so it's with this very brief sort of a theoretical overview that i'm now going to start talking about what's been happening in these two economies over the last uh, 20 odd uh, years i'll begin with india move on to brazil and then later on maybe talk a little about uh, some interesting uh, um, political economy issues between the two countries um so my central hypothesis is this that even though on the surface both brazil and india have adopted market friendly policies they've embraced markets state has been sidelined if you like to use that word um but underneath this brazil uh, both these economies have followed very different paths very different patterns of development uh brazil has converged to a pro labor um economic regime a pro labor pattern of growth while india has been converging towards a pro business development path now i use the term converge to make it clear that this process is incomplete this process is fluid and as we uh, and things can change really fast as we have seen uh, in the last year or so um in brazil um a second thing that i'll probably look at little later if i have time is um the political economy of these growth regimes i mean if you look at these two economies they adopted market friendly policies they adopted neoliberalism because import substitution uh, import substituting industrialization had exhausted in both these countries uh, globally there were tectonic shifts that were occurring uh, in the world economy so on the surface uh, economic constraints were similar both local and global economic constraints were similar but despite that 
these two economies have sort of adopted very divergent patterns of development. And this makes it, and therefore it's really important to understand uh, the political economy of um, growth in these two countries. So let me begin a little by talking about what's been happening in India. Um, now, honest, uh, truthfully, in order to understand what, uh, in order to understand contemporary India, or for that matter, contemporary Brazil, um, one has to actually be willing to go back a little into their histories. Now, we don't have time for that. Um, but I still want to mention a couple of things about uh, uh, the post-colonial development model that India pursued after 1947. Now, for those of you who know a little about India, you'll know that for over two centuries, India was a colony of uh, Britain, and that the entire colonial experience was very traumatic. And so in 1947, when India attained independence, and I'm not exaggerating, it was perhaps one of the poorest economies in the world. Uh, it, it had inherited, inherited a very lopsided economy. Uh, the population was largely rural, illiterate, uh, life expectancy was 35, 40. Um, so it was sort of within these parameters that early nationalist leaders like Jawaharlal Nehru um, decided to embark on a very um, ambitious project of economic development. A project of economic development that sought not only to industrialize a rural country, but that also sought to um, redistribute the fruits of this industrialization to uh, the vast majority of um, its citizens. Now, the big question that these initial, these early political, uh, these early nationalists were confronted by was this. Um, in a country where there's, there are crippling shortages of human capital, where there are crippling shortages of uh, physical capital, who or what is going to be the agent of this massive transformation? Who is going to take the uh, Nehru's, uh, uh, who's going to spearhead Nehru's uh, model of growth, model of development? And at least in that time, in the 40s and the 50s, it was pretty clear that the only possible agent of this massive transformation was the Indian state. And therefore, what followed between 1947 and 1980 was a state-led industrialization model uh, that sought to sort of uh, industrialize the economy, but also sought to um, uh, redistribute the fruits of development to the poorest. Now, one has to sort of understand that the Indian state was a product of very uh, contradictory forces. It was elitist. Uh, there was an aversion to asset redistribution. There was an aversion to land reforms. But the state was also informed by a very egalitarian ideology. It had an egalitarian streak attached to it. Uh, now, apart, one reason why the state had this sort of egalitarian streak attached to it was that it was its uh, historical legacy. The state, the Indian state, uh, <coughs> was a product of a particular anti-colonial struggle. An anti-colonial struggle that was successful because, because it was able to bring about a very diverse population under one tent, promising freedom not only from colonial rule, but freedom uh, from servitude of all kinds. And therefore, Ramachandra Guha, the great Indian um, historian, calls India an unnatural nation. It was an unnatural nation not because it was desperately poor. It was an unnatural nation not because it uh, wanted to embark on this remarkable project of economic development. It was an unnatural nation because um, it sought to do all this under the auspices of a democratic state. And if you look at the BRIC economies, it's only India that has had a uninterrupted, almost uninterrupted uh, uh, has had uninterrupted uh, democracy. There was a period in the 1970s where emergency was imposed for three years. But apart from that uh, period of three years, from 1947 to, uh, till today, India has been um, a political democracy. So now I'm going to cut the story short. But essentially, there were some major initiatives that were undertaken by this uh, uh, post-colonial state. And it did appear, and major, uh, and there were some very interesting achievements. But by the 1980s, the Nehruvian growth model, the Nehruvian development regime, started running into its uh, limits. It appeared as if uh, the state-led industrialization model um, was sort of um, e exhausting itself. And so, 
around the late 1970s, early 1980s, Indian policymakers decided to um, f uh, adopt a very different pattern of development, one that embraced markets, one that sort of sidelined the state. Uh, but the crucial um, characteristic of this new economic strategy, which began in the 1980s, 1990s, was that policymakers now emphasized growth above all other considerations. And they did so by um, supporting big businesses. And therefore, Atul Kohli calls this pattern of growth uh, as pro-business. right? So I'm not going to get into his argument, but I'd just like to point to a couple of things, a couple of uh, three things about uh, this pro-business model that India adopted from the 1980s. One, if you look at these numbers, uh, one thing that stands out is the spectacular economic performance. Since the 1980s, growth has consistently been uh, around 5.5, 5.6%. In 1980s, it was 5.7. And then between 2000 uh, and 2012, it uh, reached 7%. Um, and what's even more interesting is that all this has been done on the basis of saving. right? In this uh, last decade or so, in between 2000 and 2012, the actual saving rate is 31.8%. And that's an average. There have been years where the saving rates have touched 38 39%. Uh, and therefore, unlike Brazil, unlike many countries in Latin America, where the big problem seems to be one of debt, one of foreign debt, in India, uh, if you look at the indicators of foreign debt, total debt, uh, these are pretty respectable. I mean, there's nothing that stands out here. And uh, uh, on the whole, the macroeconomic profile seems to be very robust. Now, if you do a sort of analysis as to where this growth uh, is being generated, there's another interesting thing that comes up. While agriculture obviously has not done too well, uh, most of the growth has been concentrated in industry and services. But the real story behind the Indian miracle is uh, are the services. Uh, if you look at it, it's the services that seem to have been spearheading the India's, uh, India's uh, economic growth story. Um, so the second, this brings me to the second very important aspect of India's new economic strategy, and that has to do with the nature of structural change. According to the classical theory of structural change, uh, agricultural economy becomes uh, industrial, and the industrial economy, once industrialization peaks, becomes uh, service-oriented. But in India, uh, uh, policymakers have followed a leapfrog, uh, uh, leapfrogging sort of um, approach in which a primarily agricultural country has transformed itself into a service-driven country. And therefore, uh, if you look at these numbers, agriculture has sort of been declining, but it's services that have been doing very, very well. Now, on paper, all this seems fine. Uh, be because essentially what we are saying is that growth has been made possible because structural change has been biased towards high capital, high skill, high tech, in, um, sectors, not only within manufacturing, but also within services. The problem, however, with this strategy is that growth rates have outstripped um, the rate of employment generation. So if you look at these numbers here, I'm just comparing Brazil and India. Uh, I don't think you can see the colors, but the blue uh, boxes here represent the employment population ratios in Brazil, uh, an index of how much uh, employment is being generated. And the orangish uh, boxes represent the employment population ratios of India. And the story that comes out from this and many other studies, I mean, I'm just showing you one uh, index here. But the big story is that growth has occurred. But because of the skill-biased nature, the high-tech, uh, uh, the capital-intensive nature of structural change, employment has lagged behind. Um, so I mean, I could go on and on about this, but the story is that employment seems to have lagged behind. And uh, interestingly, one of the sectors that seems to be driving this decline in employment is the public sector. It's the decline in public sector employment that seems to be driving these low um, employment rates. Um, now this, you have to remember that employment is one of the most important mechanisms through which growth actually trickles down. Uh, as economies grow, people get jobs, they be become richer, and that's one of the biggest uh, mechanisms through which people sort of reap the fruits of development. And because in India, 
high rates of growth have been associated with very low rates of employment, what one has seen is a declining share of wages in total national income. And so this is really interesting because um, this has happened across the world. It's happened in China. It's happened uh, in most of Asia. The only set of countries that seem to have bucked this trend are countries in Latin America. And as we'll see, Brazil has been able to buck this trend. In Brazil, growth has actually been contingent on increases in wage shares. Um, now, one could potentially argue that labor markets, employment is only one of the many mechanisms through which growth actually trickles down. After all, state institutions, state intervention could be another potential uh, channel through which uh, um, you know, the benefits of growth actually reach to the poorest. But it turns out whether you look at uh, expenditure on education, whether you look at public expenditure on health, public expenditure on pensions, on welfare, and so on and so forth, um, India has not been doing too well. Expenditure on all these accounts seem to have been falling. And uh, here I've only taken public spending on education as a percentage of GDP. And what you sort of see is a, a scissor type of a diagram. On the one hand, starting from 2000, Brazil's uh, investments in education have increased, while in India, the exact opposite has happened. So on the whole, therefore, when it comes to India, the three things that are clear. First, there's a very robust macroeconomic profile, high rates of growth, all generated through savings. So instability has been minimal. In fact, when Latin America, East Asia succumbed to crisis in 1997, India uh, and China, of course, but India survived. In 2008, when there was a global financial crisis that affected uh, the entire advanced capitalist world, India survived. Not only did India survive, India grew. Um, but underlying all this uh, is a sort of structural change that has been biased towards capital-intensive industries. And because of this nature of structural change, employment rates have been very, very low. So the chief mechanisms through which growth actually trickles down to the poorest has been basically ruled out by the nature of structural change. Uh, added to this, because of the pro-business approach to development where the state sort of prioritizes economic growth, uh, allies with big businesses, uh, even the sort of redistributive functions of the state have been hampered. I've shown you only one example, but I could go on and on telling you about how state intervention in the social sector seems to have declined in the post-1980, but uh, uh, especially in the post-1990 period. Uh, so not surprisingly, if you actually look at indicators of human development, India has performed abysmally. So if I were to actually put this table and this table next to each other and not put the uh, names of the countries there, you'd actually think that they belong to two separate countries. On the one hand, you have this massive growth rate, amazing uh, macroeconomic profile. But when you look at how people are living, uh, the indicators uh, are pretty poor. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get into this. You can look, look at it yourself. Uh, malnutrition, whether you look at it in terms of wasting or under five nutrition, India sort of underperforms when compared to Brazil. Now, uh, one could potentially argue that you're actually uh, comparing apples and oranges. Brazil is a middle income country. It's much richer than India. Uh, so obviously, Brazil is going to have uh, higher human development indicators. It's obvious. So maybe something, a better strategy would be to compare the growth rates in human development indices. But it turns out that even when you do that, India underperforms when compared to Brazil. So I just have a couple of numbers. I didn't want to put up another table. Infant mortality between 1990 and 2012, according to a UNICEF uh, database, has decreased at the rate of 6.9% a year in Brazil, and in India at a rate of 4% per year. If you look at malnutrition, in India, it's in terms of stunting. Uh, in the 20-year period between 1990 and 2010, uh, uh, India has reduced stunting by 38% and Brazil by a whopping 69%. So whether you look at absolute values, whether you look at growth rates, however you want to put it, the story that comes through is this. You have a country that seems to be growing very, very fast, but the fruits of that development don't seem to be trickling down to the poorest. Uh, and therefore, there is, in one sense, it does make uh, a lot of sense in calling this approach a pro-business pattern of development. Um, now, I'm going to now quickly move on to Brazil. 
uh, and talk a little about uh, what's happening there. Um, now, as I began, uh, when I was talking about India, I began by saying that history is obviously very, very important to understand. You can't understand what Brazil is today unless you go back a little into history. Uh, and so I'm just going to say a couple of things about uh, the 1930s and 1940s. These decades were the peak of economic nationalism. Um, whether it was Jawaharlal Nehru in India or the great uh, nationalist Getulio Vargas in Brazil, the common understanding seemed to be that integration into the world economy is ne necessarily a bad thing for poor countries. Integration, uh, so if these poor countries are to harbor any hopes of economic development, uh, they have to somehow break away from the vice grip of this global division of labor that has restricted their economies to be uh, into suppliers of raw materials, right? So this was the sort of understanding that existed in India. It also existed uh, uh, during Getulio Vargas' time in Brazil. Uh, added to this, there's the Great Depression, which reduced uh, pr uh, prices for prim primary commodities, etc. And so 1930s, 1940s, Brazil started experimenting with uh, what economists call import substituting industrialization. That is, instead of exporting things from, uh, importing things from abroad, just make it yourself. So, um, now, initially things went very well. Import substituting industrialization produced growth. It produced increases in wages. So, everything seemed to be rosy. But just like in India, 1960s was a period of grave crisis. All of a sudden, this ISI model seemed to have been uh, uh, started crumbling. Uh, there was inflation, GDP growth rates declined, and socially there was massive polarization. I think a couple of weeks after Gulat, uh, the Brazilian president, announced his support for land reforms, there was a military coup. Um, and so what followed the period between 1964 and 1985 was a very dark period in Brazilian history. Uh, Professor Green here might be, uh, is an expert on that, so he'll be able to tell us a, mo a little more about that, uh, the social, political aspects of that. I'm going to concentrate on the economics of the authoritarian regime. What is interest? Now, remember, import substituting industrialization, I don't know if you've done it earlier, I don't know if you've uh, heard it earlier, but it is contingent on creating a home market. If you're producing something, it has to be sold. People have to buy it. And so the success of ISI depends on the size of the home market. Now, it turned out that for political reasons, land reforms could not be done, asset redistribution could not be done, and therefore the size of the home market was too narrow for import substituting industrialization to occur in the classic way. And so one thing that the military regime did was instead of looking for a market inside domestically, they looked uh, uh, to export, to manufacture goods for, ex uh, for export uh, markets. The second thing that they did was they started developing capital-intensive uh, industries, consumer durables, automobiles, uh, and so on. And because of the capital-intensive nature of these industries, wages tend to, uh, throughout the military period, I mean, again, here the estimates differ, but at least according to Bresser, Pereira, and Seidman, uh, wages throughout the military regime declined. So you therefore had, whether it's by design or simply by coincidence, a uh, growth come inequality sort of a model. That is, inequality seemed to have been positively associated with growth. Uh, this was the, uh, uh, this was what was happening between 1964 and 1985. And actually, uh, in terms of growth, in terms of industrialization, Brazil did very, very well. It was touted as the uh, a miracle economy. Uh, industrial uh, growth rates skyrocketed. GDP growth rates were almost 9, 10% for an entire decade. Um, but it turned out, as is usually the case when people try and experiment with, uh, uh, try and uh, uh, make growth contingent on inequality, that this entire model was unsustainable. And one reason for its unsustainability is that uh, the military regime took too much debt, depended too much on foreign debt. And so by the 1980s, um, Brazil entered a uh, major period of crisis, inflation reached four digit levels, um, and Brazil had to finally declare bankruptcy. Um, it had to go to the IMF, and it received loans uh, for, uh, in return for which it had to make structural adjustments. And so now we come to the 1990s, the neoliberal era. The entire story of the 1990s in Brazil 
was primarily about macroeconomic uh, stability. How do you control inflation? How do you control debt? Um, and the orthodox thinking during that period was that debt is being collected. Be uh, there's too much debt in the economy because people spend too much relative to their resources. So one short-term way of eradicating the problem of indebtedness is to simply reduce absorption, reduce demand. And therefore, basically, the sort of austerity policies that we are seeing today in Greece, uh, um, similar types of wage freezes, austerity policies were imposed uh, in the 1990s as well. Uh, in the long run, the argument uh, that many orthodox uh, policymakers made was that um, at the end of the day, state-led industrialization doesn't work. Markets are better uh, at um, markets are, be are imp you can't sideline markets. And so in the long run, uh, the IMF and other multilateral institutions sort of encouraged Brazil to liberalize the economy. Now, you have to understand that the entire process of macroeconomic adjustment or stabilization was a very, very complicated process. You had the Cruzado plan, you had the Bre uh, 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 Bresser uh, plan. Uh, but finally, in 1994, the finance minister, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, was, um, initiated the Real plan. And that was really, really crucial because it brought foreign debt down. And to a, certain, and to a large extent, it also brought inflation under control. Now, you have to remember, and this I'm going to get back to again, if India prioritized growth over all other concerns, in 1990s, Brazil's story was completely different. Brazil seemed to have been prioritizing stability over every other concern. And so in uh, post-1994, post-1995, um, inflation was low, foreign debt levels were very low. However, growth was anemic. Growth grew, uh, the total national income grew at a very, very slow pace. Um, added to this, uh, interest rates were very high. Uh, that was a part and parcel of the Real plan. And because of which, um, um, there's massive amount of deindustrialization. So Brazil, which had once uh, uh, till the 1970s, 1980s, had a huge industrial base. That entire industrial base started to sort of uh, crumble. And so the period of 1990s is really a contradictory one. Uh, on the one hand, you had the Real Plan, which sought to sort of uh, um, impose harsh austerity policies. Uh, unemployment increased, wage shares declined. Informality increased. There's deindustrialization. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to also remember that the 1990s, that the neoliberal transition was sort of preceded by a democratic transition. And so one also sees that by the end of the 1990s, there's actually an increase in social spending, slight increase in social spending. Inequality did seem to decline. Um, um, extreme poverty did seem to decline. So 1990s was really, really complex. Uh, uh, the Real Plan was important. It brought uh, macroeconomic stability. But at the end of the day, um, it, did not, uh, it did not sort of lead to high economic growth. Therefore, at least as far as from what I see, I see the big rupture occurring in 2002. 1990s was a very complex period. People call Fernando Henrique Cardoso orthodox, neoliberal. That's not really true, as we have seen. It was a very complicated period. Uh, but for me, it was 2002 that really initiated, that really marked the rupture in Brazil's uh, economy. Uh, Lula was uh, elected. Uh, he, um, he was elected for two consecutive terms, uh, first, in, uh, first in 2002 and then again in 2006. Um, and this entire period, has been uh, one where growth rates were very high, but where the government very successfully redistributed, uh, at least to a small extent, uh, limited extent, uh, it redistributed the fruits of this growth to a vast majority of Brazilians. So you can look at any indicator you want. Uh, actually, uh, UNDP has done this really interesting study. It has taken 100 odd indicators uh, for labor markets. Um, and one striking finding was that in the case of Brazil, in all the 100 or 150 labor market indicators, Brazil has shown progress. 
right? So you're not talking about one or two. In all the 100 and 150 indicators that the UNDP got together, Brazil has shown progress on each and every indicator. So I'm just going to talk about a few of this, a few of these things. If you look at the Gini coefficient, which is a measure of inequality, uh, as I'd mentioned, the last uh, uh, towards the end of the 1990s, once the Real Plan actually succeeded in controlling inflation, you already see uh, inequality sort of declining, or at least not increasing. But it's really in the post-2002, 2005, 2006 period where the massive uh, declines in inequalities have uh, occurred. Um, now, this partially is because of good luck. Uh, primary commodity prices were increasing, and as you know, Brazil continues to export a huge amount of primary commodities. So that was one reason, good, simple and pure good luck. But that was not all. The government did uh, intervene in some really interesting ways. We've already heard of the Bolsa Familia. I, I'm sure everybody's heard of the Bolsa Familia. It's a conditional cash transfer program. Uh, the government identifies poor families and it provides them cash transfers conditional on those families ch uh, sending the children to school, families sending the children to uh, uh, get vaccinated and so on and so forth. But what's most, what's very interesting about the Bolsa Familia is the quasi-universal uh, uh, nature of this program. In um, 2012, almost 30% of the population had access to the Bolsa Familia conditional cash transfer program. So they're called targeted, but in terms of the breadth of their reach, they're almost universal in nature. Um, so, I mean, I could go on and on. I, I don't want to bore you, but if you look at uh, the share of formal employment, which is, again, a very, very important indicator of the quality of employment that is being generated, uh, the story the, the, uh, what I'm the story is the same. Until the late 2000s, you see a great uh, increase in informalization, a decrease in formal jobs. But post-2002, the trend is reversed. Um, Now, I've already talked a little about human development indicators in Brazil and India, so I don't want to uh, rehearse, rehash the same argument. But let's just take a look at malnutrition rates, the most basic indicator of human development. And remember, human development indicators tend to have a ratchet effect. In the sense, as economies progress, one would expect uh, human development indicators to improve. They could improve at a slow rate, they could improve at a fast rate, but they have, there is this tendency, at least according to some economists, uh, there is this uh, ratchet effect associated with human development. But that doesn't seem to be true as when we look at this figure. In the case of Brazil, there's this ratchet effect. Since 1988, right down to 2010, malnutrition uh, rates have declined. The percentage of the population that's considered malnutrition. Initially, the decline has sort of slow, and it's in the post-1990, five period, the real period, the Lula period, where malnutrition rates have really, really declined. In case of India, on the other hand, there was actually a period where malnutrition increased. I mean, this, uh, this is the rarest of the rare. Uh, you think of increases in malnutrition during a war or during a famine or a drought or something. There was actually a period where, uh, between 1998 and 2003, where malnutrition actually increased, not only in terms of, pers uh, not only in terms of absolute numbers, uh, but it actually in terms of percentages as well. Um, now let's look at the macroeconomic profile of Brazil. And compared to India, uh, there's nothing striking going on here. Growth is, was 2.4 during the last decade of Brazil. It declined to 2.1. Uh, and even in you know the, most, uh, the last decade where there has been this entire spell of a very good macroeconomic performance, stability and so on, uh, growth has just touched 3.6. 6. India, it was around 7, 7.2. And in Brazil, it's almost half. It's 3.6. So there's nothing great going on here. <laughs> Debt, obviously, is under control because macroeconomic stability was very important. Gross savings, uh, how much uh, the country saves, has actually declined from 23 to 15. And then there's a slight increase to 16.3. So I could go on talking about this, but uh, it turns out, therefore, that uh, Brazil has been able to achieve real impressive improvements in human development, declines in inequality, uh, solely on, uh, without very high growth rates. Uh, and this, for me, is the most striking part of this comparative analysis, um, that rather than growth itself, what seems to be mattering is the process through which that growth has come about. You could have growth rates that skyrocket, that reach 7%, 8%, 9%, 
and you could still have a situation where malnutrition increases. On the other hand, you could have what, and these are anemic growth rates. There's nothing great. 2.1% growth rate is a failed state, really. But actually, in terms of uh, human development, uh, there has been a lot of progress. Um, so for me, this first part was pretty evident. And if you look at the data, if you look at the literature out there, the first part of it to say that India is growing down a very inegalitarian path, while Brazil is going down a more egalitarian path is obvious. The tougher question w for me was why? When you look at it, both countries had very similar uh, starting points. Import substituting industrialization was started in the 1930s and 1940s. It got exhausted by the 1970s. Uh, both, uh, and both countries were sort of exposed to the vagaries of international finance, to the vagaries of uh, changes in the global economy. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. There's no difference as such if you look at it uh, on paper. But nonetheless, they've adopted two very divergent patterns. Now, there's a tendency within the literature and economics to treat growth regimes as exogenous, as if, you know, they drop like manna from heaven. Uh, but in reality, growth regimes are not exogenous. People take decisions, and these decisions then lead to countries adopting, going down a particular growth path. And therefore, it becomes very interest. Uh, the more interesting question here, when you look at Brazil and India, is why have these two economies gone down two very different growth paths? Um, and obviously, the answer is going to be very complicated. There are a number of factors involved. And I'm going to concentrate on two variables that I think are interesting. The first thing that I'm going to look at is the cohesiveness of the social block that sort of, um, the social block that sort of, uh, initiated early liberalization policies. Now, the durability of any uh, mode of accumulation depends not only on the extent to which popular opposition is quelled through uh, material means, through ideological means, but also on the extent to which uh, dominant classes are able to solve collective action problems to form, to construct a coherent dominant social block. Right? In other words, class struggle, dynamics of class struggle are important, but the dynamics of coalition building is equally important. And this idea is, of course, not new. It has come up in recent studies, but it goes back to Gramsci, the entire idea of a historic block and so on. Um, and so that is one part of my argument. Uh, I argue that faster economic growth provides greater room for countries to solve this collective action problem. So India, having grown much faster than Brazil right from the 1980s, had greater room to um, solve these collective action problems. Now, obviously, coalition building class interests can't be reduced to a matter of economic growth. And if I was to tell you that the entire difference between Brazil and India is simply because India was able to generate higher rates of growth in the 1980s, that would obviously be an incomplete answer. After, uh, so, Create, constructing a social block depends not only on shared economic interests, it also depends on shared ideological values. And this is where political parties really make a difference. And here again, I think Brazil and India are complete contrasts. Now, it's been very complicated, so I'm, what I'm going to say is a caricature of things uh, that have been occurring in these two countries. But in Brazil, post-1980s is largely been the rise of a left of center government, uh, of a left of center party in the form of PT. Now, yes, they were, uh, there was Cardoso, there was Sarney, there was Color, etc. But largely speaking, at least from a comparative perspective, what seems to stand out is the rise of a left of center government. In India, on the other hand, the polar opposite has happened. Uh, post 1980s has been a period where a right of center government has, a uh, right of center political party has emerged. The Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP started with uh, two members of parliament in 1984. It formed a coalition government in 1999, and in 2014, it has its uh, own majority. It doesn't even need coalition partners. Um, now, the BJP is really interesting because um, it, ha it has been a strong supporter of neoliberalism, but it has also used religious and ethnic nationalism, nationalism for electoral mobilization. So broadly speaking, in order to sort of 
summarize everything in order to understand the political economy of the growth process, one can look at it in terms of this schematic diagram. You have this very <coughs> intricate relationship between growth, profits, human development, welfare, and so on and so forth. But this is not an exogenous outcome. All uh, the growth path that a country goes uh, adopts is um, a result of active policies that people make. I mean, the, they has, these have to be endogenized. Now, these policies could be international in nature. World Bank, IMF, international policies are important. Monetary policies of the United States uh, continue to be very important. But I'm only going to concentrate on national level policies, um, fiscal policies, etc. cetera. Uh, now, whatever it is, um, ultimately, differences in these growth paths um, could obviously be explained by a whole lot of things. You have uh, uh, positioned the world economy and so on and so forth. But as I told you, I'm going to concentrate on the role of political parties and the cohesiveness of the dominant social bloc. So this is a sort of, this is a story that I'm uh, trying to construct. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot of scope for research here, a lot of scope for experimentation. You could look at a whole lot of other factors that may have influenced these divergent growth paths. Um, world system uh, issues and international relations and so on and so forth. But I'm not going to do any of that. I'm looking at the first two um, variables. So let me again very quickly, do I have time? Um, maybe another two minutes. Perfect. Uh, so uh, if you look at <clears throat> India over the 1980s, it's a complete contrast with most Latin American countries and definitely Brazil. 1980s were not a period of uh, crisis in India. Uh, 1980s was a period of massive economic growth. In fact, in the 1980s, growth was higher than the post uh, than the than in the immediate post uh, 19 uh, post neoliberal period, post 1990 period. Uh, now, of course, everybody is going to say, but in 1991, India had a balance of payment crisis. Now, the term crisis really here is a misnomer, because in terms of actual growth rates. There's nothing really bad happening there. Industrial index of uh, the indices of industrial production did not really decline. There was a resource crunch. There was a foreign uh, exchange crunch. But as far as the real sector was concerned, there was no real crisis that was happening. And so the 1980s is a story of macroeconomic resilience, of high growths of uh, GDP and high productivity growth. And so what this did was allowed policymakers considerable room to um, um, introduced liberalization process in a very gradual and sequential manner. So the term gradualism has been used extensively uh, by people studying uh, the Indian neoliberalism, uh, Indian uh, liberalization procedure. It wasn't the sort of shock therapy, uh, loan conditionalities uh, that, uh, a response to loan conditionalities the way uh, Brazil adopted uh, neoliberalism. It was a very gradual process. There was a lot of flexibility and room uh, that Indian policymakers had. So if you look at uh, the effective rate of protection. Post 1980s is supposed to be the period of liberalization and so on. But if you actually look at the tariff rates, they've increased. So, uh, so this in Brazil's case would be unheard of. Uh, Brazil post 1980s was a period of complete deregulation, liberalization, and so on and so forth. Um, if you look at investment rates, uh, Brazil sort of has these seesaw cycles, right? It decreases, goes up, and then decreases again. Um, but in India, it's stability. The entire period from 1980 to 1990, uh, there's the stable investment rates. Say, similarly, about gro uh, if you look at growth rates, and I've taken only the period from 1980 to 1990, Indian growth rates are not too high or great, but uh, they're stable, uh, unlike Brazil. So the entire 1980 period, therefore, at least in India and Brazil, uh, in India, is a period of stability, uh, is a story of stability. Um, and so, as I'd begun by arguing, uh, because of this prehistory of neoliberalism, India was able to gradually liberalize. Because it was gradually able to gradually liberalize, because growth rates were so high, um, um, it was possible to construct a dominant social bloc consisting not only of industrial uh, capitalists, but also the urban middle classes and uh, provincial property classes. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of this. We could probably have a discussion later. Um, but I want to get to the other part of this, uh, the other part of my argument. I noted that 
political parties seem to be playing a big role. If, if you sort of compare Brazil and India, uh, one big difference is the role of political parties. Now, in India, as I mentioned, um, neoliberalism has gone hand in hand with the rise of uh, right of center parties, mainly the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, and its affiliates. Now, the relationship between neoliberalism and Hindutva, neoliberalism and uh, uh, communalism has, uh, there's been a lot of literature uh, about it. Um, but one thing that seems to be coming out of all this is that BJP has come out as the new party for the dominant social bloc. It has provided the ideological cement, so to speak, to unite the industrial capitalists, the urban middle classes, and the rural pro uh, provincial property class, uh, castes. Um, there's a very interesting survey undertaken by the Center for Societies of Developing, Developing Society, something like that, CSDS. Uh, it took up a very interesting uh, post-poll survey in 2004. And according to that survey, most of the people who uh, seem to have been voting more, seem to have a greater preference for a political party rather than a, an economic platform. And therefore, it turns out that though material interests are important, though high rates of economic growth may have helped construct a dominant social bloc, uh, a large part of the support for neoliberalism is also social in nature. It's also ideological in nature. And this is where the BJP has been very, very um, successful. It has basically been able to unite all the diverse property classes uh, under one single tent. And that's really been the story of the post-1980s, post-1990s India. Now, uh, in Brazil, we know what happened in the 1980s. It's a period of massive crisis. Growth rates declined in the 1980s. Was uh, called the lost decade of uh, Latin America. Productivity rates, growth rates, uh, basically the economy was in shambles. And because of this, in the 1990s, priority was given to macroeconomic stability and not growth. The Real Plan imposed austerity. It imposed high interest rates, imposed overvalued exchange rates. Growth was anemic. Not only was growth anemic, unlike India, Brazil had this entire decade of deindustrialization. The manufactured, manufacturing base that had been developed over a period of 40, 50 years s crumbled uh, in a matter of a uh, decade. And so industrial capitalists were um, adversely affected by trade liberalization. In fact, towards the end of Cardoso's uh, reign, um, there are a whole lot of these uh, uh, representative bodies for industrial, cap uh, industrial capital that severely opposed, uh, that uh, criticized Cardoso for his high interest rates. Um, added to this, and very different from India, is that uh, the middle class, the urban middle classes in Brazil have not done too well. In India, if you remember, structural change was biased towards skill-intensive sectors. So you had young people graduating, uh, doing a four-year engineering uh, prog uh, program, graduating and getting a good job, because that's what the nature of structural change was. In Brazil, on the other hand, structural change has been growth reducing. It has not increased uh, uh, growth rates. The increase in services have primarily been because of unproductive services. Uh, added to this, um, um, Cardoso himself increased uh, tax rates a lot. So Brazil stands out from most developing countries for very high rates of tax. But most of those tax revenues went in debt repayment and were not actually funneled back into uh, welfare uh, policies. So for all these reasons, not only industrial capital, but also urban middle classes were sort of uh, uh, excluded from the neoliberal social bloc. And so unlike India, where for a number of different reasons, uh, there was a, it was possible to construct a social alliance in favor of uh, uh, neoliberalism, the same thing could not occur in Brazil simply because uh, the way transitioned towards neoliberalism. And so a combination of these workers, um, uh, industrial capitalists, and urban middle classes, uh, is, uh, Murais and Sadfilio has called them the Losers' Alliance, the people who lost out of neoliberal policies. They were really the social base uh, that catapulted uh, PT and Lula into power in 2002. Uh, PT, as you know, is uh, a party that started in the 1980s. Its, basic, its base was amongst uh, workers, workers in the industrial belt. But over a period of time, 
since the 1980 uh, in 1980s it started as a very radical left wing organization uh, it espoused socialism uh, it wanted uh, to do away with the uh, capitalism uh, and so on but by, by 2002 uh, after engaging in you know electoral politics it sort of moved towards the center and for the first time it dropped socialism from its uh, vocabulary in uh, 2002 if i'm not wrong it also eased its policy of uh, uh, forming alliances initially uh, the party only allowed alliances to be formed with other left parties but in 2002 they decided to ally with non left parties uh, i forget what it is but some sort of christian uh, uh, democratic party or something and so uh, it was this combination of things on the one hand the inability to form a dominant social bloc because of this uh, uh, and uh, consequently the rise of pt that was able to provide a platform to this losers alliance uh, that sort of catapulted brazil towards a neo developmentalist pro labor sort of uh, growth path so i'm going to sort of more or less stop there uh, but i just want to i mean we've been talking about this uh, professor green and i uh about the importance of comparative analysis and i think for me this has been uh, an amazing journey looking at brazil and india i basically um uh i find that when you look at brazil in the long 20th century uh there seem to be more continuities than ruptures um i've talked a lot about what happened in 2002 before and after but if you look at it there's nothing revolutionary nothing radical that has changed in uh, the structure of the economy but having said that if one was to look at brazil from an indian perspective um one would be forced to recognize that in a world where uh, wage shares are declining in a world where labor is being forced into precarious occupations uh brazilian institutions their society has sort of bucked the trend wage shares have increased formalization has increased uh inequality has declined and therefore i think a comparative study brings out uh, i mean it tries to bring out these small little subtleties that are otherwise lost out similarly when you look at india from a brazilian perspective and again in india there are a whole lot of arguments as to what sort of neoliberalism is being adopted is it pro labor is it pro business will it is it pro business now but will it become pro labor some time in the future you know uh, grow first distribute later sort of a thing but i think things become more clear when you look at india from a brazilian perspective in the 1980s india adopted a pro business pattern of growth but that was not the only option it had in front of it it could very well have adopted there were other alternatives and the brazilian example does show that other alternatives exist now uh, i mean are these uh, is the brazilian uh, are any of these uh, growth paths uh, sustainable brazil is already in the midst of a massive crisis if this crisis is an inflection then we'll wake up one year from now and uh, things would have smoothed out and uh, that's it that's the end of the uh, debate but if it does turn out that this is an end of a very important consequential brazilian cycle then uh, the future of brazil is slightly more complicated what's going to happen from now is uh, in the future is slightly difficult to uh, uh, predict similarly with india already the i mean i've talked about the cohesiveness of the social bloc i've talked about the gradual sequential nature of liberalization uh, but already there seem to be cracks within the uh, dominant social bloc there are massive protests in the state of gujarat uh, modi Uh, sorry the bhartiya janata party which is being led by uh, narendra modi has lost two very important state elections less than one and a half years after uh, uh, the victory of his party and one and a half years is supposed to be a golden period you know a honeymoon period for any uh, uh, any government so again uh, there are more questions than answers but i think that's what a comparative analysis does I'm a fellow at the Watson Institute, and I didn't attend lectures by economists. But do you know what they do in an economics lecture? How many people do economics? You um, you interrupt them the whole time they're giving a lecture and ask questions about things. And I was thinking, should I do that? I said, no, that will really scare my students. I really loved your lecture, and I want to um, have the opportunity for questions and answers. Um, so um, I'll let you field them, and then I can sit in the audience and ask some questions. 
So. I mean, a question and a, a comment. The, the question, I guess, is in the early 2000s, we introduced a massive new employment project three times the amount of the local community that had affected of the world population. So how does that fit in to this neoliberal story? And then, I guess, the apples and oranges problem, you talk part of the strategic constraints of the all of this by all that process and there are sort of the kind of India very explicitly focused on developing technical resources to hold the money in secondary schools and holding PhDs which have gone on for fifty years, right? So in that sense some possibilities of existing strength and Yeah, so I think the second point is I mean, I agree with you. Uh, there's always a risk of uh, when you compare countries and you have such a long timeline, the best one can do is have a caricature of things that are going on. As you rightly pointed out, there are all these path dependencies that exist. Uh, history matters. It shapes the future, of de uh, future development trajectories of economies. So I do accept that completely. It was not simply a failure of neoliberalism. Uh, or the way neoliberalism was adopted, there is a longer uh, history to it. Now, as far as the NREGA is concerned, um, in hindsight, it seemed to have been an inflection in an otherwise clear path towards a pro-business uh, model of development. NREGA was basically adopted by UPA1, the United Progressive Alliance, which was uh, run by, which was headed by the Congress, but which had outside support from the left parties. And that was one of the biggest reasons uh, the NREJ was adopted. Having said that, after UPA won, year after year, the funding for NREJ has declined. Every year after uh, 2009, the funding for NREJ has been declined. And today, uh, there, there is news that NREJ is going to be completely scrapped. Uh, so I do agree that that's why I use the word convergence. I said it appears as if Indian economy seems to be converging towards a pro-business pattern of development to show that it's fluid, it's dynamic, it's contentious. Uh, BJP has not been in power. Pro-neoliberal forces have not been in power. Pro-business uh, pro forces have not been in power throughout the 20, 30 years uh, that we are discussing. And so there are obviously ups and downs. But in the long run, even the small little NREGA that was introduced has almost been scrapped, at least in real terms. I mean, uh, again, it, it still dwarfs the bulk of the world. So in terms of state and state and state and state and state. I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I, I, it'll be very interesting to see whether it actually gets eliminated or not. Right. right. It's, the trend is always already towards a uh, reduction. And my feeling was, again, I'm not really sure that it wasn't a big percentage of the GDP. It was a big percentage of the government budget, something like 7.9% or something. But as a percentage of GDP, it was 0 0.3, 0 0.4. 0.7. And the Bolsa family was 0.5. So I mean. And also decline. Uh, yeah. So, uh, well, at least during the Lula period, uh, at least till, uh, even till the Dilma period, the disbursements actually increased. The decline might have been more recent during the uh, post uh, you know, crisis uh, period. But at least till then, uh, the disbursements did increase. So thank you for your talk. I really learned a lot from it. And like Jim said at the beginning, I, d I know very little about India. One thing I do know is that the population in India was So I wanted to you know there's a lot of questions in the country. So I wanted to ask, this may be a very obvious question, but what is the impact on policy what do you think of this, this variable population? Because I think it has a limitation, I think, on the ability to, like, to adapt to become a market. 
Um, there is no doubt about the fact that one very lucky thing that happened to Brazil is that the number of entrants into the labor market sort of did not decline, but they weren't as many as in India. In India, there's a huge, huge percentage of the population that's around less than 24, less than 25. Uh, or in uh, in the uh, region between 18 and 25, there's a huge population that is waiting to enter into the labor markets. So potentially, that could be a very important variable that uh, ought to be included, you know, the demographic profile, in order to maybe look at the sort of pressures that the Indian government is under, that maybe the Brazilian government is not under. That is a potential, that is one of the variables that one might want to look at. Yeah. So, um, you know, I teach Brazilian history and I pretend I know a little bit about economics so my students can be fooled, but um, it seems to me that the model that Lula adopted and was one of the reasons why he was extremely popular in his two terms and Gillen tried to continue this was the China export model, or the export of commodity products around the world really relying on that and expanding on it because there's been an expansion of agricultural, massive agricultural production and deforestation and the expansion of lands, et cetera. And also other uh, raw foods, you know, minerals, et cetera. And the demand drops and then the economy crashes in, in many ways. Um, with no notion of re-industrializing the country and expanding um, uh, that sector of the economy. And so, um, the question I ask is, is it politics or is it really this world market that really caused the crash? So, I mean, one thing I, I mean, uh, that I'll begin by saying is that I've been reading these English uh, articles in the English language on Brazil. So basically, uh, Financial Times and Forbes and so on and so forth. Um, and nobody seems to be talking about the fact that the crisis today is a crisis of the world economy. It's not a crisis only linked to Brazil. So what's happening in Brazil is a part and parcel of what's happening to all emerging countries. The problem that primary commodities have dropped, that scope for export markets have declined and so on. But I think the second part of your uh, question was more interesting. Was there an inherent contradiction somewhere in Lula's policies that ultimately unraveled the project? And uh, Bayer uh, and Aman had written a paper in 2003 or 2004 in which they indicated that his continuation of many of Cardoso's policies, especially inflation targeting, is simply um, incompatible with redistribution. And therefore, they said the scope available for Lula to actually redistribute will be very limited. And he would never be able to achieve what he started out, or what he set out uh, as goals for himself. And it turned out, therefore, that the commodity boom provided just that semblance of flexibility which he could use, which Dilma could use to sort of redistribute. And yes, when the markets crashed, that's when this contradiction between inflation targeting on one hand and PT's uh, um, goal of uh, redistribution on the other hand sort of became more apparent. So, so if I may follow up, because of other factors such as a crisis around corruption and uh, denunciation of weaknesses in the government, who knows what will happen? We just had a forum last week about the future, and I was like, who knows? But it seems very likely that a central right government, which is much more enthusiastic about neoliberalism, will be coming to power. Uh, it's not a some kind of crazy populist government. Who knows what their economic policy is? It's kind of Donald Trump they would have to power. Um, and, and, that, and that means embracing the Indian model, the pro business model of medicine, because the force is trying to bring Jonah down. Ultimately, of criticizing the economic policy uh, and you know, using other discourses around that, but that I think is the essence of what is upsetting the political, maybe political, but not people are mobilizing the students, of course, that are consistently day after day, bring her down in favor of the FDP, pull down the government, whether it's tomorrow or in two years or three years or something like that. I think you have, this is a very interesting question. For a while, when UPA 1 and UPA 2 in India were in power, or more in single in India, I think yes, I missed it. Some change in 2014, 2014. Uh, And he coined the term neoliberalism with the human face. 
uh, that is, it's possible to follow liberalization policies, but nonetheless modify it, ameliorate its worst excesses. Uh, so at least the Brazilian case seems to be showing that it's very difficult. Uh, I mean, that not, not that it's impossible, but that it can be very difficult to give neoliberalism, at least the way it has been adopted in Brazil, a, uh, a human face. Uh, so it turns out that um, in the case of Brazil, uh, the entire attempt of Lula to sort of have uh, the neoliberal model, the neoliberal framework of inflation targeting and so on, and still try and create flexibility within it, completely backfired. Um, and so, yes, there could potentially be a shift towards the right. Uh, but, I mean, let's just wait and see. We, let's just wait. I mean, I'm still slightly more confident about what can happen there. It does seem to be, uh, first, as far as rights and in the Indian constitution, um, and the uh, right to education just like exists in the Indian constitution. The problem I don't think exists at the level of um, laws. Uh, I think uh, it exists more in the sense of implementation. So for instance, there is a right to education in India, that means uh, education, a right to education in India. But uh, the recent government has also uh, come up with a new ordinance in which children are now going to be allowed to work in their industry. So in order for the right to, in the constitution to actually translate into um, uh, you know, actually implementation, is the entire sequence of things that have to be done. Uh, most importantly, we need uh, the state to want to do it. I don't think that exists in India. But having said that, I think it's very interesting to look at how this um, rights-based culture differs in these two countries. And one thing, and I'm not an expert in this, so I might not be able to answer it perfectly, but one thing that sort of stands out is that in India, social movements, uh, broadly, what you call the left, uh, has taken a very anarcho communitarian term, uh, term. In the sense, they don't seem to be uh, there's no conversation between them and the state. Well, I think in Brazil it might be slightly different. Whether it was the Sanitaristas in the 70s, 80s, PP, uh, MSK. Uh, in fact, during Cardoso's period, he described the relationship between civil society and state as a porous one. So I think there might be some very really interesting differences that one could exploit and see in these two countries. Uh, but, um, and, yeah, go ahead. I, I guess the, the issue that I would bring up is it, it seems to me when you, when you talk about what are the implications of this, I'm trying to 
trying to explore the information. It seems to me a big thing would be what is the resilience of the block that led to the story that you described yeah. the culture of the So then the question is on what is that block constructed, not just whether it exists, but how, how does it come to be, how, how does it interact with the economic uh, structural factors? Yeah. So I mean, how, how resilient, it seems big question is how resilient it is. Yeah, so this is the political part, the party part. Right? I think that when the economy is weak, and at the same time, uh, the PC is, is hit by the tremendous accusation of corruption and demoralization of the party that it seen to be the moral guidance of the country carrying out a very progressive social um, rights program, that it moralizes deeply the length and file of that movement, the people who it, the intellectuals who work with it, the activists uh, of all kinds. And that combined with um, the pounding of the media against the party to bring it down, I think, has kind of immobilized it and confused it because it always had a very contradictory program, which was, on one hand, left wing social democratic and also kind of accommodationist with the government. So when Jilma comes in and appoints Fatih Abdul as the Ministry of Agriculture, who was the enemy for 20 years. Everyone who was being convinced to vote for Jill two months before is like, oh my god. The first thing she does is bring in this person to be in this ministry. So there's a massive demoralization because people think that the country is not enough up to its goals and its intent. And it's a weakened government, and it's a government that is not able to, to cutting the budget, also including the, the the economic situation is really grim. Uh, we're having a Brazilian Science Association here next year. We're expecting a 40% uh, drop of the people who the the papers are coming because they cut all of the financing for travel. So how is going to come? So I think it has to do with the crisis in the in the center of the left in Brazil about whether its leadership is really fulfilling the promises that it's given. And if I may, my analysis of what happened in 2013 was we want you to fulfill the, the, the promises. We want better housing, we want better education, we want better public transportation. And when it was perceived that Jilma didn't understand that and respond to that and show very symbolically that it was going to do something to solve that, but she didn't. Uh, and after the elections, the promises you have to let you do to signal what was the opposite, it just smashes wide scale support of people who were very loyal supporters of the two, uh, even through the election campaign. And I, I follow the way a lot of people, the baby voter, vote for blank, or the voting blank, or vote for her, and people were saying, no, it's got to vote progressive, we've got to vote progressive. And then the minute she, she, um, she appointed Kai Kabir, it was like, God, we, what a mistake to have voted that way. So I think there's a, there's a big political crisis in the middle of about the, its leadership confidence and its role and its direction. So I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person, but I'm a little bit more pessimistic about um, his, his block and his ability to sustain himself in the media And this also brings to, uh, there's a broader question here. It's all right to say we'll forge cross-class alliances. It's all right to say that, you know, move to the center left and sort of ally with whoever possible to get into power. But that decision itself limits what you can do later. So to have a social coalition of capital, labor, middle classes, and all that sort of limits the extent to what, uh, to the, limits the extent uh, to which the government can work. Um, so, uh, I mean, even in the case of India, if you look at it, it appears as if the property classes now have a party that will represent them. Even then, there are already cracks appearing there. For one, a huge portion of the Indian middle class, urban middle class, draws its, um, I mean, they basically depend on public employment. So they do depend on the IT services and so on and so forth, and that has benefited them, but they also depend on public employment. Um, so even in a case like India, which is not going through a crisis where uh, 
seemingly you have everything going for the pro business coalition uh, the cracks appearing i mean uh, thank you very much Basai, you had a question right oh yeah, yeah Sorry, I, I, please i, I didn't see that thank you uh, thank you very much for your speech. I, I, I have a very uh, basic question. Uh, so I, 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 think, uh, I don't understand why pro-labor and pro-business are fundamentally separated. Uh, like, uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you are, uh, let, let's say we are pro-business, pro-business, then the business, the product business, uh, uh, business is produced, the services business, uh, business provide, Will eventually come down to the wealth, uh, the, the social well-being for the uh, for the for the, the entire society. And on, and on the other hand, if you want to increase the social well-being of the, of the economy of the society, it all comes down to uh, supporting some businesses. Um, so it seems to me these two models of uh, uh, development are uh, inherently intertwined instead of uh, their separate. So could there be a hybrid? sort of uh, a third sort of a model that you could talk about where these things are intertwined. Yes, of course, why not? Having said that, I think what I have, what I feel after getting to the data, reading these uh, two countries, uh, reading literature on these two countries, is that essentially there is no automatic reason why a pro-business approach should necessarily lead to um, human development. I mean, that is an assumption that we can't uh, automatically make. That is what, uh, and that is my assertion. So there's this, John Maynard Keynes had this very interesting article that he wrote. It was called The Economic Possibilities of Our Grandchildren. So he argued that markets don't work, that you need a state to intervene. And so there are all these problems. But eventually, once the economic problem is solved, once things are fine-tuned and so on and so forth, uh, there's going to be no economic problem. Everybody is going to be prosperous. Now, the point that I'm trying to make is that and this is uh, the, uh, the mistake that Keynes made. There is no automatic reason why growth should necessarily trickle down. This is a compound interest sort of uh, logic that growth will increase, business products will increase. So automatically that will trickle down to the poorest. The point that I'm trying to make is if the growth that is being generated is itself is contingent on creating inequalities, contingent on dispossessing farmers from their uh, land, then growth, however high, uh, will not trickle down. Because the way, the process of growth itself is an inegalitarian one, it's a predatory one. That's the point that I was trying to make. But I understand what you're saying. Could there be, uh, could we come up with other uh, potential models or other uh, categories um, of growth, growth regimes? Of course. Why not talk about a hybrid growth regime? One that sort of uh, is somewhere in between. Uh, and as I said, this is very fluid. You, there's no reason why India will not suddenly, uh, I mean, four years from now, elect a government that takes a pro-labor path. I mean, this is a uh, very fluid, very unstable sort of situation. And there is, I mean, theoretically at least, one should potentially talk about a hybrid in-between sort of a model. But the point that I was trying to make was that gr the process of growth really matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. You So you're more likely to pay into a welfare system as opposed to the So, so, you keep going up. So, how do you do this? God, et cetera. So, so what? There are the role of the diversity. Of course, I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that the responses that the government would have to make in a country like India are going to be very different from the sort of responses that uh, would be required in a country like Brazil. Uh, social fragmentation does make uh, collective action really, really difficult. Uh, social fragmentation makes it easier for communal politics to sort of create a wedge between elite and mass politics. So I completely agree with you that the fact that India has much more diversity, uh, linguistic, ethnic, uh, religious, is um, does make it different from Brazil, makes uh, uh, the problems associated with development in such a country are very, very different. But the point that I'm trying to make, uh, that I was trying to make, was that that is why, that is precisely why 
uh, the democratic state that came up in 1947 was uh, unique to India. It was a unique response to that diversity. So there, what is happening right now in the post-1980 period is precisely a reversal of that. It's a reversal not only in the sense that the state is becoming more pro-business, also in the sense that one of the most important characteristics of the Nehruvian regime, that it would remain over and above religious differences precisely because uh, the society is fragmented on uh, linguistic, ethnic, and religious lines. That is another thing that is being uh, ruptured. So you have a pro-business rupture in the economic sphere, and you have uh, an ideological elite revolt in, uh, I mean, you have an elite revolt in the form of communalism in the ideological sphere. Uh, so for me, both of them are related. India had, I mean, there was a mechanism, the secular Indian state was that mechanism to take care of this diversity, to see to it that the diversity is not an impediment. Uh, but that, I think, is rupturing now. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.